Okay, well, hello, welcome everybody to our third Momentum webinar. This is the official hello for our YouTube series. <laughs> but it's good to see you and hear you, um, all of you. This is our third webinar series, and let's just get right into it because we're already starting eight minutes in. So, team, just the last uh, thing is I want to just, as, as we do in every webinar, I want to make sure we go through the things that we already talked about because we already had one big webinar when we talked about the introduction to momentum and structure about these two dominant traditions, right, that everybody already must have very clearly. And if you don't, don't worry because I still get confused around it. Last week we talked about the theory of integration. So we talked about what was the understanding, right? Because we said that if momentum and structure can come together, they can create massive, very beautiful, cool things, right? That's, we thought a lot of social change can happen with that integration of those two dominant traditions. So then we said, well, how do you integrate those two traditions? What are the understandings of that? Or in another way to say, what's the theory? Uh, so we talked about it last week, and I'll get to review it in a second. Today we're talking about best practices, best practices in the hybrid model. So what are some of the best ways to do integration? And next week we're talking about common problems. So quite easy. Let's do a quick review. We talked about a structure and momentum and the hybrid between those two. Uh, pretty simple, right? Structure, very specific way of organizing resources, momentum, uh, uh, very specific also way of organizing the movement. And the thinking we went through the five different ways that these two relate. We went through the spectrum, right, with some traditions being more on the structure side, like IAF, and some traditions being more on the momentum side, like the climate or the clamshell alliance. We also talked about some people that started to do more integration, like Gandhi, like MLK, and others. Last week, we talked about the three elements of the theory, remember? So we talked about number one, active popular support. And this was so key. We said like what movements are after at the end of the day, at the end of the game is to look for the active popular support of a certain percentage of the population, right? Either a majority of the population. Uh, but we also said that if you can engage 3.5% of the population of a country, of a nation, or of a place, that you can literally, that oh, well, pretty much that no government or no uh, ruler can stand you, you know, and in the U.S. there will be around 11 million people, you know, just as many people as we have without papers in this country, so any day we can change this country if we just put our heads to it. Uh, two, part of the theory is escalation. So we said, okay, well, how do we get active popular support? How do we get the whole public involved? And we talked specifically about the cycle of escalation, in this, and I'll go through it in a second, which means how do we create tons of momentum by having these large actions of deep sacrifice and deep disruption and how do they create momentum? And then the question is like, oh my God, we have all this momentum, then how do we absorb it? Which is the last part of the theory where we see that there is a lot of confusion. The last part that I'll review is the cycle of momentum. And all these key frameworks that I'm, that I'm giving you are the key frameworks that we're always going to come back to, right? Today we're going to introduce a new one. Uh, but you already seen two. This is our third one. We'll have a fourth one and a fifth one today that we'll introduce. But those five frameworks are the whole thing for what we're teaching in this webinar series. So cycle of momentum, we start number one with strong movement organization, right? Really having a strong organization that then can do the second step, which is to do nonviolent action for a popular demand. And as we said last week, this could look from, a, from something small like a picket uh, to a rally to something large like massive civil disobedience or massive sacrifice or hunger strike of a hundred or two or three or five hundred people, right? As much as it creates momentum, uh, and it could create either trigger events, as we mentioned last week, it could create uh, small moments, but it could also create moments of the world when, when everything seems like everything is moving extremely quickly and you have tons of momentum behind you. Then once you do that, then that creates popular support for the movement, and then the absorption piece, which happens here at the top, it's really about the absorption piece, which we talked about last week. Now, I know that last week we talked a lot about the theories and all the stuff. And the reason why we didn't want to jump into the models so straight is because sometimes it's important to understand why a thing works. Because we actually do not think that the model is the only way to go. Even though we think this is a very good model, we want people to adapt this to your situations, to your circumstances. So it's important for all of you and all of us to understand the theory. So that's pretty much of the review of the week. Now, uh, Paul, can you lead us to the review of the Oddport model and, and your story around that? Okay. So after the big general strike, 1.2 million people marching on the street for immigrant rights in 2006, 
two months later, we couldn't even mobilize a thousand people on the street. It was incredibly depressing. We felt like we had lost the momentum. And so we got together a coalition of different immigrant rights groups that were trying to analyze how in the hell do we keep the momentum going? How do we keep this immigrant rights movement going and recreate a moment of the world? And we started innovating. And one of the things we did is uh, we did the mass civil disobedience in Los Angeles, the largest civil disobedience in Los Angeles history, uh, where three, over 300 people got arrested, shutting down the, the strip uh, right in front of the airport. And it created mass amounts of media. There was a threat that they were going to call in the National Guard in Los Angeles, which to me was like the biggest thing in the world. It's like having an action where they call in the National Guard is like a – student radicals wet dream, you know, it, it was super exciting. But after we did all this momentum stuff, we were back in a depressed place. But this time we were like, okay, this is the second time we're in this place where we know how to create another action that can create another trigger. Maybe not a moment of the world, but we're confident we can create a trigger event. But we do not know how to absorb the momentum. Okay? And now we've done this two or three times we got to have a new model. And so um, we were trying to invent a new model, and we saw that the civil rights movement under King and the SDLC, they had created a series of events in the civil rights movement. So we were trying to study that and study what is a model in the United States that was a hybrid that can absorb the momentum and do many cycles of momentum-driven campaigns. And we really felt like we were on the edge of history, that you know, this is kind of arrogant on our part, but our coalition was going to be the one that was going to create this model that was going to bring about a new civil rights movement around the immigrant rights movement. Um, and so we were like in our garage trying to figure out like how to develop um, our, this model based on things that were ha had happened in the civil rights movement and in the immigrant rights movement. And it just so happens coincidentally that a foundation was willing to give us money just to do training, not to do anything else. And we thought we were good nonviolence training trainers and that we knew how to do it the best. But they said, no, no, we won't give you money unless we, we have these Serbians come in and do this nonviolence training. And we needed everybody to come together in a national group. And it's really hard to get everybody together. It's really hard to raise $20,000 to get everybody together. So. We said, okay, fine, we're going to sit through this boring nonviolence training. And I had been through many different nonviolence trainings and had led a lot. So I thought it was just going to be another one of those. I was going to sleep during the day, and that night we were going to have the real meeting. So we show up, and then all of a sudden we meet these Serbian revolutionaries that were bad ass. And not, they, like, drove their Ferrari up to our garage. We were trying to create a little new car, a little new movement. And they had a Ferrari. It was already worked out. It had already de developed a, a hybrid model that was incredibly sophisticated and had a tradition. And it, they actually proved that it could drive. They actually proved that they could create multiple levels, multiple moments of the world within their country. And not only that, um, so this is, this is the group of people that and we became, I became like a, a, a worshiper of Ivan Mark who's uh, the Serbian revolutionary who uh, systematized a lot of their stuff along with some other Serbians and started doing trainings all over the globe. So not only did they create a model that created a series of momentum-driven organizations, uh, momentum-driven uh, moments of the world win, and then they absorbed it and did it and to get to a point where they did it over and over and over again in a cycle anywhere from two to five years, and then actually got to a place where they toppled their brutal dictator, Milosevic, but they trained a lot of other people um, in a lot of those theories. Now, so what I call this movement is it was a really innovative model that was using things that had uh, kind of come out in many different spheres. But it was really an open source, decentralized movement that they had developed because they were at a point in their history where they had done general student strikes and had shut down all the universities in, their, in, in Belgrade for six months. But they were depressed because in, in, in 1998, a uh, year and a half after that, they could not 
keep the momentum alive. So they really tried to create a hybrid between what they call protest and organization. And they created that hybrid um, in, from two, 1998 to 2000, 2001. They had this amazing movement. Uh, and uh, uh, Von Marovic was one of the great uh, thinkers of that movement and systematized it. And since then, a lot of those technologies that they developed in how to create a hybrid has been spreading across the globe. Now, a lot of conspiracy theorists think that it's like this evil, conniving lizard men that go around and they give you the blueprint and that's all you need and the revolution breaks out. That's kind of condescending to the local activists because we all know that a good plan is, is a very small part of what makes a revolution work. It's an important part, it's a small part, and also it's really complex because each piece of technology isn't just given by the lizard people. It's, it's, there's consensus and there's democracy and there's lots of people all decide on that plan and they tweak it and it evolves. So in the color revolution, a lot of these new models, these new decentralized movements that uh, mimic in some ways uh, the octopore model in being decentralized has broken out uh, among the globe and those models some of them have taken big pieces from the Oxpor model and other ones have developed their own. But these color revolutions have really devised different ways of thinking about the hybrid that we were really trying to, to cook up. And I really believe that in the United States, the next round of major social movements that will break out in the United States and America will be because of these new technologies being tried out. And when we were trying to do it, we were trying to use a structure that was hierarchical, a union structure, uh, that a major labor movement was, we were trying to get them to do a mass civil disobedience. But what we realized is a lot of times in Egypt, in a lot of these color revolutions like Serbia, it wasn't the major political parties with tens of millions of dollars of resources. It wasn't the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that had the largest political and social service organization that ended up leading the revolution because hierarchical organizations could not absorb the momentum. The people that could absorb the momentum were the scrappy bunch of, a lot of times, youth, of college-age youth, who were thinking about the hybrid, who understood the theory and, and front-loaded, and what I mean by, I'll get into front-loading, but they really devised a organizing model, a new organizing culture, because a lot of people, as we were talking about in webinar one, are entrenched in either the highly uh, momentum-driven clamshell alliance model in the United States, something like that, which is really good at creating trigger events, but not good at absorbing momentum, or they're really good at structure, which is good at creating organizational structure that's more permanent. But there's very few people that can transcend the ideology of their organizing culture and their organizing tradition and create a hybrid. And what Von Marovic said in the first webinar, we quoted him, is that the break breakthrough and revolution comes when people understand that there needs to be a hybrid between those two, um, between structure and momentum. But we talked about the theory in webinar two, and now we're actually saying, okay, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the model of how they devise the hybrid, okay? Did I burp? Burp, let's go. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here is that we believe that the, the quintessential hybrid needs to use a decentralized organizational model. And one thing that we're really, uh, it's really amazing is that this technology of thinking about how to, to absorb momentum into a hybrid and how to do that through decentralized organizational stru structures is actually very popular. I'm getting some feedback here. Is that, who's that, that? Is somebody mute? So, um, that's breaking out all over the place. And it's, it's not people who, who know about Octpor, the, the, the Serbian revolutionary model, which was one of the first ones to invent that, but it's coming from many different spheres and it's part of the evolution, I believe, of human organization. Right now, there's a huge uh, flourishing of knowledge around new, decentralized, highly participatory democratic models of organization. And we see that in um, organic systems theory, in uh, open source, uh, the open source movement, 
in new political parties that are coming out around these things. Uh, the evangelical Christians are now organizing a lot in that way. U.S. party political parties um, are using this new decentralized organizational model. And we have a, a deep tradition in the United States with, uh, of the 12-step program that has used this model. But all of these things have common that they're frontiers. They're new organizations or they're, they're experimenting in how to basically coordinate in volunteer ways, in voluntary ways, to coordinate masses amounts of people um, through momentum. Um, and they do that through a process we call um, primarily front loading. And uh, what is front loading? Well, front loading is this concept in that in the momentum tr structure, or there's a lot in the US, a lot of times in the anarchist tradition, uh, or in is very individualistic, has a lot of those elements within that subculture where the clamshell alliance sort of came from that wants to do consensus decision making with a lot of people and doesn't want to have that much structure. That tradition does not have that much organizational structure. It does have some things that are front loaded, like you see in Occupy. There were certain things like Occupy had a meta narrative of everybody talking a lot the same and they had some of the process like a general assembly and a tactic that was front loaded. But what we're talking about in a lot of these models is a real complex uh, front-loaded structure, scaffolding, DNA. There's a lot of ways to talk about it. But there's a lot of rules that allow for the greatest amount of autonomy, but within boundaries so that that autonomy does, creates unity. So you need to have, you need to balance Great, high, high levels of autonomy with high, high levels of unity around a common purpose. And how do you do that is in nature, there's a lot of models of how this happens because that's how nature works in ecology. And uh, at birth, people and animals are, are born with a DNA which has millions and millions of years of evolutionary intelligence that's embedded in each individual that gives them boundaries for intelligence, for the body, for all these things that allows them to survive and has the intelligence that sort of inoculates them, that prepares them for the major obstacle in each organism, the major sort of defense mechanisms that allow them to survive is embedded within their DNA at birth, at birth, so that at birth, they can have tons of autonomy and yet still survive. Um, and then when each, each organism replicates, it embeds its DNA in the next group so that everybody can coordinate together. So instead of just thinking about being decentralized as total autonomy, anybody can do what they want to do, whatever, we have to break that. Organic systems and decentralized organizational models are thinking about the combination of structure and, uh, and that is needed and the DNA that is needed so that there can be high, high autonomy and high unity. So decentralization, decentralized organization needs more structure, or we should say rather they need more structure around essential principles that allow people autonomy, but also allow them not to be um, hurtful to the survival of the organism. But it's a different way of thinking about structure. And the example of when that doesn't work is cancer. Cancer is cells that do not follow the plan of the DNA. And when that happens, then the whole system is jeopardized. A structure allows for the most amount of autonomy within its boundaries, and the boundaries are well-defined so people don't interfere with the movement. Rules, procedures, structure, and vision established at the beginning of the process to establish it so it can escalate and operate with as much unity and autonomy. Next. Perfect. Well, just to add here another quick example that might be useful for people is that in society this manifests itself as culture and the rituals that people continuously to do consistently. And sometimes in organizations, as we all know, organizations have cultures. And sometimes we say, well, why do this organization always go, goes through the same problem? And this is what we'll do in the next webinar. But it's because it's part of their DNA. And sometimes uh, 
we don't like to think that there's good or bad DNA, but there's certainly DNA that allows for more participation, that allows for more autonomy, and it's hard to figure this out. We're not saying it's super easy. But also there's DNA that totally inhibits it. And really that's the problems of a movement, when a movement cannot grow. Because in your DNA there is not enough uh, source or there are not enough elements for that to grow. Uh, so Paul, talk to us on the organic systems theory. So organic systems theory is uh, one of the most complex ways of thinking about uh, how decentralized organizational structures work. And this is the DNA whole metaphor around the DNA and how to apply that to organizations has been developed within organic system theory. Uh, organic system theory and complexity theory are, are very merged. A lot of people study uh, each other. Those two things are really the same field. But anyway, those, um, that field has created a whole bunch of books and academics and consultants that go around and apply how nature runs decentralized organizational models to um, human models of organization. And we, we're going to borrow some of, some of their, their work. Next. Another uh, thing that just has really accelerated the understanding of how to do this is GNU um, Lennox uh, in Wikipedia. And what I want to say with Wikipedia is, it's a good example. There's a lot of autonomy in Wikipedia, but there's also a lot of structure. But that structure is specifically designed for everyone to participate. Okay? But there's a lot of rules. Okay? It's not like anything goes. No, there's a lot of rules, but yet those rules are just infrastructure, and they're, they're enforced collectively by everybody, not just from the top, but everybody enforces them. In the software, GNU and Linux, the open, open source movement, it took uh, years and years and years to develop GNU and Linux, which was the operating system for the whole open source movement. And without those rules, without the, both the source code that allowed open source uh, programmers to work within, but also creating the rules of how to basically collaborate with each other, the legal rules of how to distribute it uh, and not, not around copyright, all these things. It created basically the rules for an, another type of gift economy or open sharing, open source te technology to spread. That took a lot of front loading, okay? More front loading than we would ever ever think in, in the movement that we've been accustomed to, like Occupy or the Clamshell Alliance or in the Global Justice Movement. But it sort of shows you that, uh, a, and a lot of that is taken for granted by people who do open uh, source movement. They just, they just assume that there's all these rules and what it means to be part of or participate in open source is to agree to those, those rules that are now embedded and replicated in, in the whole open source technology. I mean, the whole open source movement. That's me, right, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I'll rock and roll. So what I like about this whole piece is that, um, just to do a little step back, is that uh, I love the discovery that Paul and the team had around Oddborn, you know? And uh, I got to actually meet Ivan around those times as well. And I, they, they show us the model. I didn't understand the theory. And to me, that's where I struggled with this at those years. Uh, but to me, the coolest thing lately is that other people are coming up with the same thinking, yet they don't even they don't even know each other. They haven't even heard of each other's work. And there's this great, great book right here by Rick, I don't know how you say his name, Falcon Ving, whatever, Skull Swamp Weiss. Uh, and he's the founder of the Power Political Party. And I just want to read a little bit about what he says because it, it, it also implies what Paul is sharing, which is he says, the few people upholding the scaffolding of the swarm will resemble a traditional hierarchical organization. So he's talking about essentially structure. However, it is important to understand that the role of the scaffold scaffolding is not directing and controlling the masses as it would be in a corporation or other traditional organizations. Rather, its role and value is in supporting the other 95% of the organization, the swarm which makes its own decisions based on the values you communicate and looks like this and looks at the scaffolding only when assistance, support, or resources are needed. So I think the paragraph was spoke by itself, but just this understanding that the people and the leadership of the people that, and we'll talk about the elements, and one element, another way to say it is the core people, are supportive of all the other teams, 
by creating enough space for people to have enough autonomy to run the campaign that people need to run in a broad spectrum of a movement. And we'll give you some of the things of how that happens. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Marshall Gantz and the Obama campaign in a second, but Paul, do you want to talk about the evangelical Christian? Well, it's very interesting that uh, some of the most amazing organizers, including Rick Warren, who, um, whether or not you like his politics, uh, he's probably right of center in a lot of ways, but the evangelical Christians in the United States of America have really understood that the future is decentralized, and they created their own model. And they created the model the same way we did, which is they studied decentralized movement, and they also studied organic system theory. And they developed models that allowed them to have thousands of small decentralized mutual aid groups. And that's what gives them tremendous amounts of power to mobilize a hell of a lot of people. For the Republican Party, a lot of evangelicals are the biggest base for mobilizing people to vote. And a lot, some of that is because they have thought about how to do, do decentralized organizing, and the missional movement is taking it one step further. They're really trying to develop new models that can spread virally throughout the country. So, um, uh, go on, Carlos. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And, and team, just also to know that, uh, because I can see your chats, so if you're thinking something is confusing or something is useful, like Curtis just said, Thinking of organizational DNA in comparison to Wikipedia and Linux is very is helpful, good examples. So if you have things that are working for you, chat them in there. If you have a question, we can just stop it and we'll answer your question in the instance. So just put it on the question step. So let's talk about US political parties. So I actually, as I shared with you in the last training, I learned mass training through Marshall Gantz. And Marshall Gantz really, I think, really understood mass training and then got to systematize some more through the New Organization Institute and all those groups win the Obama campaign. And I want to read this quote that I found in a paper that Marshall talks about kind of his reflection on the Obama campaign, because it's the same thing that, that the political, uh, that the power of political parties say. So I'll just read it. It was very clear that a spontaneous self-organization, uh, the wish for result of online organizers is a myth. On the contrary, developing a motivated skill and a strategic volunteer effort required ongoing coaching of organizers who in turn could provide coaching to volunteer leaders, creating a virtuous cycle of increased capacity. This required an ongoing investment in training and coaching that could cascade down through the campaign as those who learned the skills were called upon to teach them to others. So really the mastery of Marshall Gantz and his contribution to the Obama campaign was to figure out how to get mass training into campaigns so that if people will come in joining through the momentum that Obama was already generating, right through all his speeches and all the good stuff when people used to cry when he used to say stuff now everybody cries for other reasons uh it was for people to do mass training so i just want to point it out how the political parties are using a lot of this stuff as well and of course they're using it in a different not in the purpose that we want them people to use it but it's already happening in a lot of their work paul you want to talk about 12 steps so I want to say uh one thing that we've learned a lot from is the 12 step tradition uh the 12-step tradition has created millions, uh, millions of people that are actively engaged in supporting each other. If you combine all the free therapy that is given to people in 12-step, it is more than almost every single therapist in the United States of America, uh, all their hours of providing support combined. Um, I'm getting some, some, some uh, noise. Uh, Thank you. So uh, the 12 step tradition, uh, the reason why it works in some ways, Bill W. used an anarchist organizing model and he admits this in a lot of ways. He studied other popular movements and he really systematized the DNA so well. It took a long time. It took him three to six years just to really get the first five or six groups of AA in the United States in like three or four cities. But once it got the DNA down, it exploded and spread all across the country and involved hundreds of thousands of people. But they was only able to do it because he, he really spent a long time systematizing the steps and systematizing the tradition that allowed each group not to implode and not to interfere with other groups so that the movement could, could have incredibly high levels of democratic participation 
and autonomy at the local group level. But these traditions are very sophisticated, and we're going to talk a lot more about them, what the traditions are and the concept of tradition, which is basically systematizing the culture that you want, getting it into a well-clarified uh, and replicable and distributive uh, DNA. And we're going to talk a lot about that but uh, in the problems. But uh, it's just really helpful to realize that 12-step has one of the most advanced models of thinking about that. Sorry, I was stuck in a mute. So thank you, Paul. So Tim, now we're going to go into the second and last, uh, actually the last part of, our, of this webinar, which we're going to spend most of our time on, which is the elements of the DNA. So the elements of the decentralized uh, model that we're talking about. But before we go into that, are there any questions, anything that you feel is confusing or anything that you feel is helpful? So I just want to open that up to see if you want to put a question or something in the chat. We can get you to talk or you can write it down. Just to know uh, from what Paul and I are sharing, uh, what's helpful and what's confusing. Okay, let's see. Let's wait. I need seconds. feedback, people. I feel insecure. I don't know. I can't see your faces. I'm talking to this amorphous mass of people. Your feedback gives me warm fuzzies, and I need warm fuzzies. So please send your warm fuzzies, or if it's a cold prickly, you can send that too. At least I know you're out there. At least I know you're out there. So, okay, Paul. So uh, Leland is saying, oh, go ahead, Bell. You can read it. Okay, yeah. Leland says that the front-loading concept was really, really, really helpful exclamation point. Perfect. Okay. So, team, we're going to continue, but again, know that uh, the questions and the chat is always good, as now we're going to dive into some intense stuff. So, and also feel free to, to ask questions about things that are unclear to you, because we know that we're yes. working with a lot of new concepts that are kind of complicated, so that's totally fine. And if you're unclear on something, it's very likely that someone else in the session is also confused about it. So you'd actually be doing us all a big favor if you ask. Woo! Okay. Let's keep going and rock and rolling. So teams, elements of the DNA. So can everybody say elements of the DNA? Elements, elements. Of, the DNA. of the DNA. Perfect. Amazing. I love that all of you are very engaged. So, <laughs> so team, we, there's nine elements that we're going to go through today with you. But I wanted to put them in three different little buckets. So the first one, which we think is very important, is the core. The second one is the grand strategy slash theory of change. Uh, and the core has really to them. We're going to go through each one of them. The other one we think it's really important is meta narrative and meta brand, which is the story and the branding of your campaign or your movement. And the last part, which to me has to really do with the structure of your movement and how, our, which Paul was saying about the principles and the rituals, is one nonviolent discipline, which Paul will get to talk probably for three hours about. Two is team structure, which I will share how you structure your teams so that your teams can have a lot of autonomy without needing to have an organizer all the time there. Because in movements, you can have the capacity to have 600 teams under your belt, right? Uh, three, we'll talk about mass training, which we talked a little bit about last week, but we'll go into some details. We talked about action format, which is another way to say how teams, how local teams do planning. So how do local teams think about how to take plans, making goals, and executing their work? And the last one we'll talk will be online infrastructure. So those are just the elements. There's nine of them. Let's dive into them. Go. Do. Oh, wait. Shit. There's so what I wanted to say is when I studied uh, the Clamshell Alliance model, which Barbara Epstein calls the direct action model, that has been replicated in the, the AIDS crisis with ACT UP and the global justice movement and most recently with Occupy, um, that model has a lot of things that are front-loaded. Okay, they have a lot of things that are front loaded. And what I mean by front loading is it, when we were mobilizing for Seattle or for A16 and the anti globalization movement, we had a, a message that was already developed. We had an action plan. We had a basic theory of what we were doing that was a t t tactic in a campaign. We, it was like a concert kind of. And go on, the, the, you can go to the next slide. That had been developed by a core leadership. And a lot of times, we didn't even know who the core leadership was. We, we just joined with our feet. Whatever plan was super exciting or whatever, whatever concert that we 
we wanted to join, we joined. And that concert had a whole structure of how people should participate, a meta narrative, a meta brand. It had a lot of elements of uh, of front loading. But what it didn't have is a lot of the essential elements that we saw in the Akpor model, which was much more complicated. Okay, and a lot of that is because they didn't do enough front loading. There wasn't enough front loading. And when um, when the uh, April uh, the the April 6th movement in Egypt, uh, Ahmad Meher, he, he was one of the founders of April 6th. He came to the United States and he came to Occupy. And Amy Goodman was interviewing him and saying, well, what do you think about the organizational structure and the movement Occupy? And he said, oh, it's a horrible organizational structure. I don't know what the hell you guys are doing. And Amy Goodman was like, well, what organizing structure do you use? What organizing model do you use? And he said, we have a very structured, unstructured organization. That's what he said. It was lost in translation because it was Arabic. But what he meant is that they were very structured about certain things from the get-go, about their purpose, about a lot of things before people even joined on. And then they were very autonomous and unstructured about people doing a lot of things. In an Occupy, they actually had a lot of structure that you had to go to the General Assembly around. Okay, and that that was actually a bottleneck of decision making. So in this this model, what we do is the core leadership develops the front loading, and they are not this vanguard that controls everybody. They give everyone tons of autonomy within their structure, and they're the creators and the stewards of the movement, and not the vanguard. A lot of people don't even know who they are. Uh, people vote with their feet and they join on to the movement, and we want a thousand flowers to bloom. We want a thousand different movements out there. But if you join on to one movement, you need to have a common unity around the elements of the DNA, or else that organism is going to implode. Okay? So we like diversity, but we want diversity within different movements. Okay? And if you're going to participate in an action, you're going to participate in a movement, there's certain things you need to agree on, or else that movement uh, will have cancer within it, and it will it will die. So. Go, go on. The core leadership is the one who front loads the strategy, and it's a, it takes time. It takes time to do that. It takes a lot of thought to do that. And we actually advocate for the core leadership to be a hardcore team that ends up being the embodiment of the culture and of the DNA and thinking about the DNA before it launches virally. They're not the vanguard. They do not. They're not the centralized leadership. They just disseminate. The, the boundaries, and then they enforce it. If somebody breaks the DNA, they go around and help people basically say, you're breaking the DNA and this is affecting everybody else. You should not be doing that. And they, so they help basically like white blood cells uh, go to other people. So, Paul, the tips, for example, for the people in Serbia, uh, they took, how long was it, Paul? Was it about a year that it took for them to create their master strategy? Yes. So team, this is, I think, to us, is very key uh, on the context of the core leadership. So we'll just read to some of the stuff because we think it's very important, right? They're the creators and stewards of the movement DNA. And let's I split that up because I think it's very important. First, they're the creators, so they're the ones that are coming up with as many things as they can. Two, when things go wrong, they're the ones that have to say, uh, that's not what the DNA is about. And that's a hard part in the movement, right? When in the middle of the movement, people are going crazy and they're saying like, well, I never seen you because you did not organize me. We just organized ourselves. So who the heck are you? You're like, well, I'm the founder of this movement. They're like, fuck you. So they, they also the core is a group that is really trying to figure out when things don't go well, how to bring that back into the DNA, how to get back that into the DNA, right? There are also the people that launched the first trainings. And this is a picture of the core leadership of the United Farm Workers, which they did a lot, a lot, a lot of organizing uh, of farm workers uh, about 30 or 40 years ago. And they also had a way of decentralized structure. They actually had uh, boycotts and around, boycott committees in around 50 cities across the country that were also staying through volunteer organizing houses uh, that, you know, that were organized autonomously in their own way. You know, one last thing to make a distinction on the core leadership is that they're not the vanguard, meaning they are not a centralized leadership body. They do not govern. And this part is really hard to understand 
because most of us think that because we're the core, we got to make all the fucking decisions. And I, oh, I'm sorry, I just swear a webinar. Sorry. That we got to make all the decisions. And really, what they are have to do is more like I think what Marshall and what the guy from the Swarm site was saying, what Rick Hoffman was saying, was we have to be the stewards of the DNA, the creators of the DNA, and make sure whether we can coach people through it. It's easier to say at the beginning, but when people go and have hundreds of thousands of people, it gets crazy. Paul, anything you want to add in core leadership before I go into mass training? Oh, you're a great job. That's good. Okay, let's talk about mass training, and then we're going to get to grand strategy, which Paul's going to rock and roll. And okay, it, so... Oh, okay. good. Oh, good. So on good. the mass training piece team, um, so we're also trying to show you this in a way that maybe makes sense in how you credit in the process. So once you have the core people, which are your core activists, maybe 7 to 12 people that are really committed to going through this process of actually creating all these pieces, right? Then once you say, well, we're going to launch, you can launch with a big action. But uh, the people in Serbia, the way that they did it is they did a lot of mass training, meaning that they did a way that they can disseminate the DNA and get a lot of groups started throughout the process. And I think they was at 40 to 70,000. I read in some books to 70,000, but it's been a lot of people that they train. And the funny thing that Ivan shared with me and shared with us is that after the first 130 or 50 people he trained, he never trained anybody else because they had to train the trainer's model, which we can talk more about next week or later on the thing. So I read a couple of things here. One is the embodiment of the DNA culture. And this is so important. For the people that have been with me in the dream movement, there are things that when you go to a dream act or dream movement organization, everybody fucking does across the country. You're in Texas, you're in Oklahoma, you're in Arkansas, you're in Boston, you're in California, and everybody does the same thing. They snap the same way, they clap the same way, they use the same words, they use the same way of doing meetings, they tell the same story. Like, if the dreamers can get anything done, and we got anything done, is the story. Like, that's, we have it down. Other two minutes, prepare, we have the meta narrative, everything complete. So, really, it's the environment of your culture, and what mass training actually does is allow you to show what the culture is. And a lot of that is even non-verbally because you have to show people, even in your personality and your leadership, how they have to carry away the movement, right? Uh, last part that I said here is that it can, it can expand as fast as the capacity you have to train. And for me, mass training is key because this is how we can absorb momentum, but this is how we can also train a lot of activists. And there's a specific way to do mass. There's multiple ways to do mass training. We can talk about it more on the phone if people are interested, but... We wanted to mention this piece, uh, but it's the way that we disseminate the DNA. Go ahead, Paul. So I just want to say this. I've done a lot of mass training for actions, like in the global justice movement, we were trying to shut down these trade summits. We take everyone through a training that was generally around two to four hours, okay? But when the Serbians and, and Ivan Maravik started training me, they did a training, not for two to four hours, okay? They did a training that they required for every single member that, that was going to vote or going to participate in a team, went through this initiation that gave them the whole effing package. It allowed everyone to be an entrepreneur. I'm getting some disruption on this. Um, so it, it, it included the whole effing package, and it took them literally five days, two to three hours per day for five days. And for me, I was like, I can't believe you did that. It took, you did this for tens of thousands of people. It seemed like that's a really high bar to ask people to become members. And he says, yes, it, it is really hard to get people to make that commitment. But when you have a lot of momentum, it allows people to go off and do their own thing because you give them the whole package. And they're not going to disrupt your organization. You have to spend more time if they don't have the front-loaded DNA. So... Mass training we're talking about is a full weekend, which is two to three days or a whole week. It's about 20 hours that has every single element of the DNA that's needed is in that mass initiation training. Everything that they need to survive and to become their own entrepreneur without screwing up the movement needs to be embedded in the mass training so that um, once, once they leave that mass training, they're going to be unified with the movement. Thank you, Paul. Yes, you got to give them everything. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of it. And then there's even advanced training. So once you have a crowd of 100 or 212 volunteers and leaders, 
Can you give them more tools so they can do what you're doing? But we've got to give them mass training on all the elements of the DNA. So, Paul, let's talk about grand strategy because I think that's going to be the big piece of today. Yes. So, the grand strategy to me is the most important part of the DNA because we were talking about the theory of change being like 80% of all the arguments being about the theory of change we'll go into later. But if you don't have a grand strategy, then a lot of other problems exist. You need to have a unified strategy. Now, I want to say this grand strategy is not a detailed master plan that everyone follows. It's a basic blueprint. It's a basic idea of how you're going to win. An outline for the most basic plan of how the movement's going to win. It is not a front-loaded tactic or a campaign. You, you don't have to figure out every little action or tactic or campaign that you want to give a lot of autonomy for people to do whatever the hell they want to. Um, whether it's a divestment campaign or a sit-in or an occupation or whatever. But everybody needs to understand that all their diverse efforts are around the same basic strategy. The grand strategy is to make sure everyone has the same basic theory to change, the same basic objective, and the same basic method to achieve it. This uh, this was not in Occupy. They did not have a grand strategy in Occupy. They did not in a, uh, in a lot of the efforts that I was involved in in the Global Justice Movement, we did not have a grand strategy. And because of that, we had warring fractions in the movement that were all fighting around different grand strategies. And when we talk about a grand strategy, the Oxford Movement when, and a lot of the Colored Revolutions, use, you, they develop a two to five year grand strategy. Okay, um, and a two to five year, and what that is, is there's going to be four elements of that grand strategy. And really what the grand strategy is, is about articulating the grand strategic objective and then the phases to achieve that, and I'm going to talk about that, but really it's leaving up everything else to everybody else, okay? And what I mean by the grand strategic objective is that you need to have an understanding of what your movement is going to win. And then understand what are general phases to get to that victory. What are general sort of steps that, and then within that, there's a lot of campaigns and you will let, you, you can devise campaigns and other people can devise campaigns, but different local groups have autonomy to choose what campaigns they work on. But all that, all those campaigns also have lots and lots of tactics. And, and the local groups devise their own tactics and whatever. And when I talk about the plan format, I'm going to talk about how everyone, whenever you do planning, people need to understand strategic thinking. They need to understand how everything is correlated to a grand strategy. So there is a strategic objective, phases, campaigns, and tactics. And I'm going to take you through um, some different ways in which different movements have actualized these four phases. The grand strategic objective is the broadest concept of what the movement seeks to win. Achieving a strategic objective for the ultimate goal of the movement is the, almost always the final victory to be won. Second. Okay. Can I add one part to this? Yes, yeah, sure. Go for it. In, in the dream movement, our main strategic objective was to win the DREAM Act through legislation. And because we front-loaded our movement to be about legislation, which is actually the way that we were front loaded because the whole immigrant rights movement is, is based on legislation. It took us so much work to tell people we were going to go and target the president to get something executively. Think about that difference, like of how you frame the strategic objective. Because like we were at moments confronting the president and some people will raise their hand and they will say, but what about the Dream Act and legislation? And it will be like, didn't we talk about this the whole freaking new time? Is because we had promoted it that way that everybody talked about it that way. So that's the great strategy, Paul Clayton. So the phases are the major objectives that serve the benchmark achievement as the movement approaches the final victory. This is the primary timeline to assess the movement's progress. So um, sometimes you can do that around public opinion. You can do that around understanding where the movement's at, how big it, it is, what phase the movement needs to be for certain actions to happen. The campaigns are, you probably everybody on the phone call understands campaigns because that is a, a lot of times either a strategic uh, goal or demand, a symbolic demand, a campaign demand that, that you win within one campaign that allows you to win public support 
uh, allows you to, to seem like you are winning, you're victorious. You can go to the next one, campaigns. It's a plan of action designed to achieve a phase objective by making demands on power holders and contains a series of nonviolent actions to use to apply pressure. Now, even though it's applying pressure, the demands are primarily symbolic. You're winning demands that allow you to win the public opinion. Okay? And a lot of times, even if you don't win the demand, if you win public opinion, it's still a victory. Uh, but campaigns are the best way to frame the theater so that you can win and you can create dilemma actions and you can create things. Tactics are the limited plans of direct action that contain methods of nonviolence using involved engage, engagement with the target and pressure uh, of the media, the presence of the media. Okay. So, just to break apart, that seems confusing, but I'm going to break down a little bit. This happened in the Civil Rights Movement. So the Civil Rights Movement tried to create full federal equality for people of color in the United States because they didn't have the same equal rights as other people. And um, so the movement through momentum created basically phases. The first phase was desegregation of public and private institutions, which was the end of, of, of Jim, part of the end of Jim Crow, which there was tons of black people and people of color could not use the same schools and the same public facilities. And within that, there was a lot of different campaigns. Okay, so there was the, there was the, the Montgomery bus boycott, there was the Freedom Rides, there was the Birmingham campaign, and each of those campaigns were part, were leading up, getting more and more public support, winning symbolic demands that, that gained more and more support and more pillars started falling so that they could win that demand, which they won, uh, so then there, there was tactics involved in that. So you go on to the next one. Uh, can you take this real quick, Carlos? Got you, bro. I got you. So, team, as we're saying, and we just go back to the start, and we put the top, the grand strategic uh, objective, and then we go through the phases, and then we go through the campaigns. I think the part here that we want to talk about is how, in one campaign, you have multiple tactics. And this is the hard part sometimes over this confusion. So, for example, in the Memphis, the segregation campaign in Tennessee, where they did the lunch counter sittings, the lounge counter sittings were one tactic, and actually a tactic that replicated through multiple parts, and even within Memphis replicated a lot because they did it every weekend. Uh, but then you have a boycott, right, to desegregate the shops. You do some economic pressure. Then you do a march to engage your actors. So you can have hundreds of tactics, hundreds of hundreds of tactics under a campaign, even if you want, you know? Uh, but then that campaign has to be part of a specific phase of your movement. And all this, every tactic you do, every campaign you do, every phase you do has to be because of your grand strategic objective. I don't think we can say this more and more and more. But if your grand strategic objective is not clear, it's going to be really hard to do campaigns. Because everybody doesn't know how to strategize around what. Around what are we strategizing? What are we making plans for? What is this phase about? So, Paul, do you want to walk through the Selma Voting Rights Campaign? You want to do that? No, go, you go for it. Okay. Well, just in the Selma Voting Campaigns happens the same things, right? I mean, there was a, the, the murder of a young individual that was trying to get the right to vote, and they went to apply uh, to vote at the courthouse, and somebody was murdered. And then that generated momentum and, and discontent. And then there was this march that, uh, that, you know, the first march was called Bloody Sunday, and a lot of you remember the image of John Lewis getting beat the crap out of uh, in Selma. That created more momentum and they did more marches until they would eventually got the national government to intervene uh, and let them march and protect them and kind of defy the Alabama authority and created momentum for them having voting rights legislation just a year later after the Civil Rights Act. So what again we're trying to make the point here is that if you have a very clear strategic objective, you know the specific phase, you can run multiple campaigns. Selma wasn't the only campaign that was run around voting voting rights. There was also the, free, the Mississippi Freedom Summer. There were multiple other campaigns, but we're just trying to show you this so you can see the breakdown from the pyramid and see how everything has to fit. Everything has to fit. So let's keep rocking. Uh, Paul, upward. This, this allows you greater amounts of autonomy because if you have a unified strategic objective, and you have, you have very clear phases, which, which are pretty simple. Once you have the strategic objective, most people will agree on the phases. 
then people can do whatever they ha- the hell they want on campaigns and people can vote with their feet. They can have a lot of autonomy to choose what campaigns they want to be involved in and what tactics. But there's a level of account- collective accountability to be strategic. You can't be strategic when there's multiple different theories of change and there's multiple different ideas of how of what the strategic objective is for your movement. And in Oxford, another good example is they wanted to overthrow Milosevic. And so their movement created in their DNA the strategic objective and the phases, and then they allowed for a lot of autonomy for the campaigns and the tactics to, to go on. And their phases were, one, they had a, a phase of individual resistance, which allowed lots of people to do small acts of civil disobedience to build their movement. And then once the movement was big enough, they united the political opposition uh, together, and that was another phase of their movement. And then after they united the political opposition, which was very hard in Serbia, they uh, for, they had a general election in which they monitored the results, and then they enforced enforced the general election through a general strike. Okay, uh, there was an escalating series of nonviolent actions that led to an all-out economic, political general strike in the country that toppled the dictatorship. Okay. They set that out. They said, this is what we're going to do from the beginning. Everybody knew that that was their strategic objective. That was the phases. And then there's, there's so much within the outline. As you can tell, it's very broad, very general. Go on. Well, people have some questions for you. I just want to put them out there so you can answer them. Shane is saying that the point on symbolic versus material victories is one of the hardest things to explain to organizers from the structured tradition. She also said, people are really attached to the Lynchgate notion of material victories as a thing that empowers people. So can you talk maybe a little bit more about symbolic uh, versus instrumental campaign demands? We're going to do a lot more in the next webinar specifically about that, which is the most common problems for this model. Um, but I think you're totally right. It is one of the most challenging issues to deal with, okay? And even in the divestment campaign within the I, 350.org and the, uh, the climate divestment campaign on campuses. I, I've been in conversations with, uh, with uh, Bill McKibben about some of these issues with Yvonne Marovic. And, um, and I think that the grand strategic objective for the, the, the divestment campaign is great. And I, I think they have a really good idea of what they need to win. The problem is people, I'm getting some interference on the employees. That there is some, uh, there, there is a lot of disagreement about how that is won. And if you go to the next slide, that's a lot because there is a, a, a conflict in the theory of change, which is that if you're going to win public opinion, it really doesn't matter as much whether or not you're making little material gains. That doesn't matter as much because you're going to win when you get a critical mass of active public support. And when that happens, everyone's going to, going to come over to your side. But it takes a long, long time and a lot of faith and a real belief in that theory of change. Um, and a lot of local organizers who, who don't believe in movements or haven't been part of movements don't believe it's possible to change the political climate. If you were to t- tell local organizers that we're going to change public opinion around gay marriage 10 or 20 years ago, they would say, that is crazy. And they would have just devised little tiny material things to win for gay people. Now, that's not necessarily wrong, but what it does is it narrows your whole perspective. If you're going to really move public opinion, your whole framework of how to do that and how to construct campaigns becomes much more about moving the masses instead of creating little material gains. Okay? And when you can think creatively about moving and getting active public support, if you can really think about that theory of change and develop symbolic demands, um, it allows you to create moments of the world and trigger events. It's very hard to do that around stoplights. It's very hard to do that around these, these incremental material gains. But it's really easy to do that around, it's much easier to do that around big symbolic things that everybody resonates with. So that is a transition, and a lot of that has to do with getting people around the theory of change, which 80% of the problem. So if you're just talking about symbolic and instrumental with people, you're going to lose the debate. They're always going to win because they're going to function from their culture. If you have a theory of change and you share that with people, then people can understand symbolic demands and the importance of them. 
but really it's a conflict of two different traditions and two different theories of change. Is there any other, did that answer the question, Carlos? Yes, Paul. Let's just keep moving. This is good, but okay. we just want to make sure this is great. So let's just review the principles and Paul of grand strategy before we move into no violent discipline. So the pyramid reveals that everything in the movement does from the smallest method of nonviolent action to the most intense campaign should support the grand strategic direction and movement towards the final victory. The grand strategy must fit your, your theory of change and you need to really teach people how to think strategically and how to be accountable to your grand strategy and how to do that collectively. And we, we talk about that within the plan format. Uh, which we're going to go into later, but the plan format is basically teaching people how to plan and strategize and develop actions that are in unified around a common vision, around a common grand strategy. Okay. So people make fun of me a lot of times because I'm very passionate about nonviolent discipline. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, I've been in actions where people have thrown mobtail cocktails at the police and I was trying to stop them. I've thrown my body in between cops that have been beating me with billy clubs and protesters that have been spitting in my face, okay? So I'm very emotional about this and what I'll have to say is that it's almost always underestimated at the beginning of your movement, whether it's labor leaders or whether it's student leaders. When you start a movement, you're not, you're not, you don't have like lots of momentum, you don't have lots of emotions and anger, I mean, it's there, but once somebody goes to jail and gets tormented, or you have martyrs and people die, we had martyrs in the global justice movement, where people died from being beaten by cops, and you have a lot of, of violence that breaks out, uh, perpetrated on you by the police and the military, it's very hard to maintain nonviolent discipline. In every single nonviolent movement, this has been the biggest challenge. And it's not me who says this, it's Gandhi that says this, it's Martin Luther King that has said this, is that that is the biggest challenge for their movement because it's natural for people to feel so much anger and pain. And when they have anger and pain, they create a rationale to want to fight back. And if you don't, in your DNA, create very deep principles to nonviolence, you will lose nonviolent discipline. And once you lose nonviolent discipline, your basic theory of change is to gain public support, okay? Once your movement turns violent, grandma is not going to participate. Churches are not going to participate, okay? Huge portions of the population are not going to support your movement if it's perceived as violent. There's no way to get the 3.5% in the United States through property destruction and through violence. It's just not going to happen. Whether or not you morally believe in nonviolence, I don't care. I don't care if you're a Christian mystic like I am. What I care about is that you win. And to win, you need a critical mass of active public support. And you actually need, also, you need to pull the pillars. You need the police and the military, not at the beginning, but at the end of the movement, to come over to your side. And right now, the police departments in the South are now supportive of the civil rights cause, at least a lot more so than they were when the movement started. They're not like they used to be, which is they used to be an arm of the KKK. And the reason it was, is because the movement did not create an adversarial relationship with the police, and there was a lot of defections that had an importance, that spectrum of support. You have to allow everyone to join your movement, and you can't do that if you're yelling at them, if you're spinning in their face, if you're telling them that, that they're, they're traitors, they're not going to join your movement. You want to move everyone. You want to pull everyone to your movement. And the biggest barrier to do that is whether or not you can maintain nonviolent discipline. And that's very hard in a decentralized movement because you have no centralized leadership that is forcing people to do things. So what you have to do in your mass training is train everyone in the principles of nonviolence, why it's important, from the beginning. And there's no compromise. You cannot allow for compromise because when you allow compromise in that, it starts to spread. Whatever's in your DNA from the beginning it starts to spread, and you will lose nonviolent discipline. And I want to say this from personal experience. In the Occupy movement, we lost nonviolent discipline. Diversity of text became the predominant uh, 
culture within the movement. And diversity of tactics is anything goes. And as much you escalate, in the global justice movement, we had diversity of tactics. That meant that some people were throwing mobtail cocktails. And that's just the reality. When you allow for no accountability and, and you do not have principles of nonviolent discipline, you, you should assume in a decentralized organizational structure that you will lose control. That's just, that's just natural. And almost every movement struggles with that. Um, and so you need to bake it into your DNA and you need to train everybody that it's their responsibility to enforce it. And if they don't enforce it, that they'll lose control and that it's the biggest challenge for the movement that's using momentum, the cycle of momentum to maintain that nonviolent discipline. And it, and it was in the civil rights movement. It was it was in the anti-war movement, it was in Occupy, it was even in the immigrant rights movement. We had a huge struggle in Los Angeles maintaining nonviolent discipline. So you need to do it from the beginning when it doesn't seem to make sense because no one's talking about violence. You need to bake it into the DNA. Thank you, Paul. The nonviolence moment of the webinar. We have to keep nonviolent discipline. And nobody can enter the movement through mass training if they do not agree to uphold nonviolence. That's very key. <laughs> so, okay, team, let's go to the next part. And we have, it's 8.14, so we'll go through the last elements just a little bit quicker, so we can have five to 10 minutes of discussion and allow that to happen. Uh, but what, so the other element will be meta narratives, And pretty much it's the way that everybody in the public debate has a core narrative in which people can interpret the world. So for example, uh, in Occupy, Occupy was actually quite good about this, and a lot of people still use Occupy's meta-narrative. I mean, if, even up to today, people talk about the 99%. They talk about the 99% versus the 1%, right? Wall Street took all of our money, and we're all the people that are broke, and we've got to fight and get unite, and mobilize around. That's pretty clear, right? It, this is the part about the meta-narrative that to me is very important, uh, which is that the meta-narrative cannot be complicated. It cannot be using political lingo that most people do not understand. And this is something that I get really mad about and when people send emails out, I don't know, this is just me probably, when people send emails out and they send emails out and sometimes I don't even understand what the heck they're saying. Like there's all this political lingo and I'm just thinking like, holy guacamole, if I was a person in my living room and I just saw an action and I get excited and I want to sign up, well, first of all, I don't even know what the heck you're talking about because I don't have the level of political education, you know? So your meta narrative has really be based on how people view reality, even use the words that people use to view narrative. Some people uh, have used surveys, some people have used polling to see how people say certain things, right? Uh, but the beautiful thing about the meta narrative is that then you can have multiple other narratives in within them. So for example, when Occupy happened, you can have narratives about people that get, you know, got thrown out of their houses, that that was part of the banks and the failure of the banks, and they're part of the 99%, so they're fighting the banks so they can have their homes against the 1%. Pretty clear if it's narrative. In the dream movement, this is something that I'm very proud of us, even though we have complications now too with it. But I think that we were pretty good about getting everybody to have the same meta narrative. And this whole story about the dreamer being the person that comes here and doesn't know, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a part of the story that in some ways talks us a little bit with the rest of the community. But there's a part of the story that allows us to gain public opinion. So it's very interesting how we're going to figure out this for our next challenge of the immigrant rights movement. Uh, but yeah, meta narrative, meta narrative, meta narrative. I'm sorry we're moving quickly. We just want to make sure we have time for a conversation at the end. Let's go next, Paul, meta branding. So I just want to say that sociological studies and psychological studies show that people cannot really have relationships with that many people without really getting people confused, or really feeling an emotional connection to people. So one of the ways people uh, psychologically deal with that is that they group people together. <laughs> and they group, do that symbolically. They do that through mm -hmm. symbols. And that allows them to have a deep emotional relationship with a lot of different people that affiliate under the same brand. So, if you have a deep relationship with McDonald's, every single time you go to McDonald's, you're, you feel that you are going to the same entity. You're having the same relationship with the same entity. If you went to all these different stores, you would have a separate relationship with each one. And it would, it would be very hard for you to develop an independent relationship. With the public, that's super important because if the public is going to relate to you, they need to relate to you as a movement. They need to understand that you are part 
You're not just some small person that they can't fit into into the, the amount of relationship they have. They're going to fit you within the understanding that you're a representative of a movement. And what it does is it amplifies the effect of every individual action then becomes part of developing a relationship with the public so that everyone has credibility by having the same brand. But on the on the other side, you need front-loading so that you don't lose control of people using your brand so that in Occupy or in the Global Justice Movement, when people start throwing mocktail cocktails or start beating up police, uh, then everybody's going to associate you with the brand, with the movement. Uh, and they're going to say, you guys, you guys threw mocktail cocktails, you guys beat up the police, you guys broke the window. So it, there, that's the double-edged sword of branding. We need an open source brand that everyone can affiliate with so that the public can engage you and so that you, everyone's power is amplified. Every, all the thousands of diverse ac actions can be seen as, as a unified, powerful phenomenon. But on the other hand, we've got to make sure that everyone that uses the brand agrees to all the DNA or else they damage the brand. Just like if, if, um, if one little store of Wendy's has a finger in their chili, every single Wendy's, no one shows up to any Wendy's because they don't, they're like, oh, that's so gross. There's a finger in the chili, you know. And so uh, if they didn't affiliate with the brand, it was some local store that had a, thing, you know, a human finger in the chili, it wouldn't really matter. But if you do one little thing that affects the entire brand, it really has damaging effects. Is that a real example? Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that, no, it is yeah there was a human finger Ew. in one, yeah. one of Wendy's chili. Yeah. Uh, uh, now I don't want to have dinner anymore. I, I, I came back on camera just to ask that. <laughs> okay, so let's go into team structure. We have just one, two, three more slides. Actually, I'm, I'm finishing the whole thing, and then we'll do discussion time. So team, on the question of team structure, uh, pretty much the question here is how do we build teams then can have the DNA, but can run autonomous campaigns. They can do autonomous stuff with it. So for example, there's, even in the 12 step, there's a 12 traditions that really allows us to how to organize organizations. So this is, we can go in much more depth about this. Uh, but for example, one way to do that is that sometimes in groups, there's this thing about like, oh my God, we cannot make a decision because we don't have everybody here. And I imagine a lot of you have been there where you're really pissed off, you wanna make a choice. It's like, well, we need everybody in the room. So one way to eliminate that is to have the principle of voting with your voting with your feet or or, may, or voting with your commitment, right? So for example, whoever is in the group right now, whoever is the people, if you have a majority of people that are committed to doing what you're planning for, you can go for it. Very clear team structure. Uh, for example, the guy from Swarmwise, this guy that I share with you, Rick, he talks about the principle of like if three people want to do something, they can form an organization. And that organization or a local team has the full support of the whole movement, the branding of the movement, the DNA of the movement, and it's so cool. Can you imagine if you would have people across the country, if you have three people in a living room and they say, we want to be part of the Dream Defenders, we want to be part of this network, we want to be part of the Southern Network, and suddenly they say, well, technically in the rules, we can be an organization with three people. So those are the, some of the rules and the procedures and the principles that allow for team formation. Now, in my experience with team formation, uh, the way that we founded United We Dream was that not for, to have chapters of United We Dream, but actually to have autonomous local organizations. And we actually never called them members, we called them affiliates. And people told me, why the heck do you call them affiliates and not members? And I said to them, because I don't have enough time to get to them. So they have to know that they are not my member, that I'm not responsible for their well-being. They have to organize themselves. So we always said to people, come form a group, but then you're on your own. You make your own decisions about campaigns, and actually what we give to people is that everything that happens around your locality, it's you. And our commitment is that we won't do anything local, I guess it's in consultation with you. So where there was all these principles in our bylaw and our membership structure that really allow people to have as much autonomy because we didn't have any resources to support them as much as we can. But then we also, through mass training, gave them the DNA of the Dream Movement, the meta-narrative, their strategic objective, what was our grand strategy to win in a period of over years. And even in our training, we talked about what were the team roles that people should have. 
So I'll end with this. But for example, in the dream movement, there is something called education net deportation coordinators, which are the coordinators that form teams all around deportations. And if you go to any dream movement team across the country, in United with Dream or outside, everybody has a person that is dedicated to deportations. Because we baked that in from the beginning of the movement for everybody to have those specific roles around, you know, there's the dream empowerment educational coordinators, the ones that only look at college access, and there's the ones that look at only deportations. So you can bake so much thing in and team formation that it can get to be replicatable. Okay, next. Action format, actually, I think this is you, Paul. Um, so action format, basically, you want to have a ritualized way to do planning around action that allows people to constantly be reinforcing the theory of change and grand strategy. And they, they need that little structure, and they need a little initiation action that allows them to get, get in a ritual of holding each other accountable to do strategic action. Without that, what happens is people just throw out lots of actions, and they're, they're not really well thought out, and they don't really conform to the general strategy. So having a ritual and sort of a format of thinking about that, in Serbia they did that, uh, the Dream Movement actually does that, and it allows everyone to have a common strategic framework and understand how every single element helps and unifies the movement. Carlos, I can't hear you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> so the last one is the online organizing component. And what I would say here is that actually the Serb you gotta think about this. The Serbians did a general strike. And they organized a massive uh, let's just say poll watching operation where they they literally organized volunteers throughout every poll station around Serbia to make sure that to see if Milosevic, the dictator, was going to do voter fraud. But you got to understand this. They did not have any Facebook, Twitter, or email at that time to, <laughs> to make that happen. So now we have total new tools that can allow for absorption, which is the last part of our theory, remember, that can happen. So, for example, uh, what we say online organizing here is that we have to have the system, meaning the online lists, the online software, the website, and this thing takes time, team, for the online organizers are theirs. You know that this takes time to build. I don't mean like months or anything, but it takes a lot of time to do that, uh, you know, to really organize uh, the groups and to really provide that avenue for absorption, even to ask for petitions. And as I said in the last training, how many of us have created momentum? Another freaking organization took the momentum away from us because they had better online systems, you know? I don't know, I love move on, but sometimes I just wanna like, because I feel like if you're gonna take that much much absorption, you gotta put more momentum outside, right? But this is just my commentary uh, on this, right? But pretty much online organizing allows people through a combination mass training and action participation to increase engagement, right? And it could also become a huge source of movement income. Because people, when you have a lot of momentum, will be down to throw you out 20 bucks or, or $15 or $5. But if you get 10,000 people to throw you $5, you're on game. So we'll, we'll end. I mean, Paul, if you want to add more stuff there, that'll be great. No, it's great. But let's get I into just, that. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I just want to say at the ending is when I, when, when I was given this model and I, I understood the complexity of it, and it's very complex. We just, I mean, we really went through a lot of concepts that make this, this concept work, but this was the most advanced system of thinking through how to actually create an organization that is a hybrid that I've ever seen, and I said, oh my God, they gave me the keys to the revolution, I'm going to do it tomorrow, you know, it, it is true, this is the keys, this is the magic, and I believe that a lot of times revolutions uh, generally explode when people are given the keys, but just because you have keys to the car doesn't mean it's easy to drive it and doesn't mean it's easy to get the engine and the transmission and everything working, okay? But you have a blueprint, and I believe that is the most advanced and the most amazing blueprint for how to run a revolution that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I believe that in the United States of America, I really do believe that this is the frontier, and I really think it's, gonna, it's not going to come from structured organizations. It's going to come from people like you, students like you. I felt like that was 
the commercial. I love this, Paul. Okay, team, so let's, Belinda, come help us out with opening people up. I know, Curtis, you have a specific question, so, uh, but I don't understand it well in the text. Can you just maybe get Curtis and mute it and see if we can ask it again? Sure. Okay, great, Curtis, you're on. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, so my question is, you used the example of United We Dream um, with kind of a local affiliate model where kind of the folks at the, the national level, the staff, we're mainly providing, uh, I guess, like, you know, training for folks. So my question is, um, with a decentralized model, what is the role of that, like, leadership core? Is it just mass training? Um, and and w what are some of the other roles that those folks would have? And then a, a follow-up to that is how do we throw down on kind of mass days of synchronized action, mm -hmm. right, when you have a decentralized mm -hmm. model? Is it just, yeah. like, you put out viral yeah. marketing? Like, how do you get real buy-in? And, and that type of model. Okay. Well, I'll go through the United with Jim Peace and then Paul, it will be great. Maybe if you can answer the second part of the question or both as yeah. well. Sure. Actually, uh, guys, class, Curtis, before, before we get deep into answering this question, I just want to flag that it's 8.29 and uh, this is scheduled to end at 8.30. So if we want to make announcements about readings quickly before we lose people. Uh, okay. So I'm going to uh, send out readings with Belinda about different decentralized organizational structures. Um, and so the reading this week is going to be about a lot of the emerging models. I'm probably going to give you a little bit around swarm wise until you can see a little bit of how they did it. Um, so, so good. There, has, there hasn't been much written specifically about the Oscorp model. I'm writing a book. Uh, I'm, in con I'm on book contract with the nation to write a book with my brother that, that mentions and, and writes about the model. But anyways, uh, we're going to send out that reading. Make sure you spend the time doing the reading. It will be a lot more productive for you to do this webinar if you do. Great. Thank you, Paul. And then the other thing to be aware of is that we're currently accepting registration for our May webinar, and we'll be sending out a registration link and some materials to you. So if you want to uh, spread the word to people in your teams or just people you know, um, we definitely encourage you to do that, and you can feel free to reach out to us if you have any more questions. Okay. Thank you, Bill. And if people have any more questions, please write them down, and we can call on you. And if people want to stay until midnight, we're down. But at least 30 minutes will be fine. Okay. So, Curtis, I think for us it was a constant tension because uh, we actually did not understand uh, this concept of decentralization that much because I was brought in the structure tradition. So to me, I saw this pattern, and I called it organization versus movement. That's how I called it. And that's how I trained people around the organization versus movement. And there was a moment for movement, moment for organization, which is kind of how I explain absorption and all the dynamics to people. But the role that we had was a lot of about coaching, about training, and also about running campaigns and creating uh, pretty much the DNA and changing the DNA. Because we didn't have this concept that you can front load the whole thing from the beginning. We front loaded as much as we knew. But then at moments we came back and from loaded more because we're like, no, now we got to change the direction of the whole thing. Uh, so, but for us, it was attention. Sometimes local groups didn't want to do what we wanted them to, to do. So, you know, that was kind of the tension of having some staff at the top and some people at the bottom and a lot of negotiation. Paul? So, this is what I will say. Um, I call this the tension between um, top down, complex. Uh, prophetic promotion versus bottom-up emergence, um, and there, there's evolution at both ends, okay? So sometimes you have dispersed actions and campaigns that bubble up, and the, the top-level top leadership is figuring out, oh, there was a great city that got movement, or in the DREAM Act movement, there was uh, a lot of technologies about how to get people out of detention centers. So the top just basically created training and allowed for those technologies to spread. But really, the technology developed from the bottom. But my experience is, is that a lot of prophetic promotion, big action scenarios, are very complex skills that local groups do not have. But the core leadership does. So a lot of times what happens is the core leadership gives different plans, big action plans. And they measure that based on people voting with their feet. So they throw out prophetic promotion around an action or something, and they get feedback. And a lot of times when they get a critical mass, then um, they know that they have enough people, and it creates a cycle in itself. Just creating the action and getting 
like 100 or 300 people, like we did this around the mobilization for healthcare for all, we did sit-ins in 12 different cities. And once we had 325 people in about six different cities agreeing to do sit-ins, we knew that it was going to go viral. So we pitched the vision, and then lots of local groups voted with their feet, and then when we hit a critical mass, we used all the national infrastructure to, to get other people to help and support it. And that was sort of top down. But a lot of that um, is, is tested. And bottom organizations can do that, but it's very rare for a local organization to come up with a really big prophetic plan to do things nationally. They just don't have the skills. Sometimes they do, and when they do and they get a critical mass, then that needs to be supported by the core leadership. So uh, th does that answer the question? Does that? So this is good. Uh, folks, if you have any other questions or thoughts, just write it down there so we can, or comments. It will be great also to hear what was useful from the elements of the DNA that we share, but also what's confusing so we can talk through it. Confusing or unclear or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I think everybody's more like, wow. But we just cannot hear them. Is that the case? <laughs> Maybe they're like, oh. Like, well, we want to they're like, oh. well, I need some feedback. I need some feedback. Was it, was it like a radical movement orgasm that we had here? Okay. Or everybody's just I, like, I feel kind of ucky. I don't know what to do with okay. myself. I want to say that I need Leland, some Leland feedback. Said, yes. Wow is the feeling. So I just want to point out that we were feeling it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Janelle also loved it. And Leland said that one of his favorite method moments was uh, very deep principles of nonviolence in the original DNA. I actually screenshotted you, Paul, like going like this because I want to make a meme of you saying nonviolence from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> meme, meme, meme. <laughs> I can tell you a lot of stories. I mean, just in seriousness, one of the reasons I'm really emotional about it is because uh, I have been physically uh, hurt, mm -hmm. and I've had friends that have been traumatized and are, go through post-traumatic stress syndrome, partly because, like, individualist, I, I'm not bad-mouthing anarchists, but these, like, people who are really angry are, are doing things and break windows and then they don't deal with the consequences and people go to jail for some serious time and they get tortured in jail and when we were in jail no one advocated for punching a cop because you know it, it the consequences were really serious and a lot of times people don't understand the consequences of their actions so I, I take it very personally I've had people that have really been emotionally screwed up because people have thrown punches at cops and thrown rocks and and been beat up because because of, uh, of violence. So there is a question uh, from Sane and says, curious about the strategic role of charismatic leaders in adjusting movement DNA midstream. Example, Chavez fasting when violence was on the upswing among the union. Will. So we're talking about decentralized organizational structure. Akpor, in when they were doing their general student strike, um, in before Oxford was created, they had charismatic leaders, and they got pulled out. Some of them got thrown in jail. Some of them, you know, some of them were assassinated and stuff. So they they said we're not going to depend on charismatic leaders. This model does not depend on charismatic leaders, but natural leaders will emerge. Important leaders will emerge, and that are symbolically important. Um, and the core leadership and other people can still play a, a big role in enforcing the DNA and making sure that people from the beginning have agreed, everybody's agreed to the DNA, but that they don't backtrack on their agreement. And that, that can require fasting. But in this movement, there's less, it's less about individuals and it's more, it wouldn't be just one individual, it would generally be multiple people doing that. Because we're not depending on the brand is not the brand is collectively shared between teams. The brand is not a charismatic face. Like in the United Farm Workers, Cesar became the brand of the movement. You know, we're not doing that. We're not encouraging that that behavior. Mm -hmm. And Paul, one thing that I want to add before people do more questions, or some people leave, we we'll probably end in the next two minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, please write them down. But that we understand, Paul and I know, that this takes time to do. Like to make the DNA, to create it, to think through it.
for to get feedback. And Paul and I and Belinda and Max, we're putting a training together called Momentum. This is a webinar series uh, in the third week of June. We're going to send more information to all of you um, after the ending of this webinar series. But we're going to spend four days talking about this. But not just four days talking about it, but the purpose of our whole training is to create a DNA. It's that you come in and you say, well, I want to do this. What are the elements that I already have? What are the elements that I'm missing? And how do at the end of the training you have at least a certain 30 or 40 or 50 percent more of the DNA that you were missing and at least know how you can get the rest of it? So uh, this is not training that we are trying to raise any money from or anything like that. We do this because, again, I, as also for beliefs, we think that this is the cornerstone of movement. And we're going to practice it and redo it and launch new things. And we really think it's going to start with you. So we just want to put it. It's only for 25 people because we don't have that much resources. So if you're really interested in coming, please let Belinda know uh, because you already went through this webinar experience. We have rapport with you. We think that you're, you're a great leader. So just let us know. But we just want to put it out there because this is not as easy as just writing it down. It takes practice. I want to tell you that this uh, this webinar is probably my like tenth or twenty, like at least a dozen training where I've gone over the same material over and over and over again. It took me years and years and years to grapple with this before I was able to to apply a lot of it. And I'm not saying hopefully you can speed up the process so it only takes you you know two or three trainings. But I'm just saying like it it, it is this stuff is complex, you know, like when I was trained in a structured organizer, it took three years just to call yourself uh, an organizer. So um, hopefully with the decentralized model and front loading, you can, you can get the, the package earlier, you can get it faster, but it still takes time. And if you're going to develop a core, it's going to take time to develop that DNA. And if you're going to develop a DNA, you really have to understand it. You can't just understand it theoretically, you have to understand how to actually do everything we're talking about. And that's why you need the training. I need the training too. I know. This is good for us. And team, we're going to be providing, we're trying to systematize this whole thing for a training experience, which we actually think it's like mass training. So we're thinking, how do we, you go through it and then you can take your people through it. So, uh, so team, it's already, I know Curtis said that he really wants to come to training. So Curtis, if you want to come, we'll see you there, buddy. Uh, but, Bell, do we have any other last announcements? Sorry, A40, I want to be respectful of people's time, but this has been a great webinar. I feel very excited. Any other final thoughts or closing comments? Um, I guess that's it. I was just trying to remember something that I read in a book recently. It was either in this book that I'm reading right now about courageous resistance or this book about movement for a new society called Oppose and Propose that I feel like it had a really interesting take on charismatic leadership. And that it wasn't like, like, we shouldn't rely on charismatic leaders, but when certain people come around that, like, embody a higher moral authority, that it can, it can serve as, like, a role model for other people and inspire other people to, like, kind of operate at that level. I was just trying to, like, dig up the reference, but that's random. Um, but then in terms of logistics, no, just look out for the readings, people, and um, the link to the webinar and all that stuff. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Paul, anything you want to say? I love you all. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. Paul loves you. We love you. See you in the next one, which we talk about the most common problems with this stuff. Leland loves you, so too. You need to come back. Come back. You need to come back. back. Yeah. Don't be a hater. Come back. I want to <laughs> talk to you. Okay, okay bye, bye, bye friends. Take care.